Find the brand features the people who are making things happen. Get insights to grow your business from the experts who've done it. Get behind the brand. Sponsored by DocuSign, the global standard for e-signature. Get your free trial at DocuSign.com forward slash behind the brand. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with creator and host of the very popular show, Dirty Jobs, Mike Rowe. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks. Mike, I usually ask my guests, how'd you get this job? <laughs> I lost a bet. <laughs> Tell us about that. Uh, well, Dirty Jobs was really, <laughs> it's, it's a good question because there's really not a snappy answer, but I'd been in the entertainment business for about 15 years. And uh, Dirty Jobs happened mostly because my grandfather got sick. And he was a tradesman all of his life, electrician, steam fitter, pipe fitter, uh, architect, engineer, welder, mechanic, all of that stuff. Very handy guy. He only made it to the eighth grade, but by the time he was 30 or 35, he was pretty much an expert in all those areas. And he really could never find anything on television that looked like work, mm -hmm. you know? And I had been in TV for a while uh, doing a whole variety of things that didn't look like work. So I thought, you know, before he moved on, it would be nice to do a show that celebrated uh, guys like him and women like him, you know, people who weren't afraid to get dirty and who basically did the kinds of jobs that made civilized life work. So the show started as a series of very simple profiles. Discovery ordered three hours of it. And after the first one aired, we had about 10,000 letters from people wow. saying, ah, you should meet my mom, dad, brother, sister, cousin, uncle, right? Yeah. And uh, in a moment, we realized, oh, maybe this is something yeah. bigger than three hours. Yeah. But you didn't just roll right into success, right? Talk to us about some of that time before uh, the show really hit. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of the freelancer. I'm a big fan of, of the entrepreneur, but I even more so a freelancer because I think that, you know, for a long time people looked at freelancing as the thing you did if you couldn't get a job. But, you know, as an expression, you know where freelance came from, the word? I don't. It's actually an old medieval term. Hmm. And it was applied to knights who were skilled in their trade, but served no lord. They were freelancers, hmm. essentially, right? And they roamed the countryside. They're basically mercenaries. And I always like the idea of that. And when you look at the trades, you find many freelancers. And when you look at Hollywood, you find a lot of people, actors certainly, who are suddenly writing, or writers who are suddenly producing, or producers who are suddenly waiting tables, right? or, or whatever it is. Yeah. You know, most anything you look at, you can look at as a trade, and you can approach it as a freelancer. Yeah. So I got in the business because I liked the idea of hosting game shows or talk shows, doing some acting, singing in the opera, doing some producing, doing some writing. And I like to touch everything like it was very hot, you know, work for a couple of weeks and take a couple of weeks off. And that's what I did for about 15 or 20 years. Dirty Jobs was very much of a miscalculation, a happy one, but I'd be lying if I said I did anything other than Forrest Gump my way into it. Let's talk about, um, you know, this being a freelancer entrepreneur. Do you think it's something that's born or is it uh, taught? Is it learned? Mm. I think the idea or the way that you choose to approach your vocation is 100% a choice. Obviously, you know, there's inertia from what your parents did and the other people in your family and your friends. You, you take your cues from the stuff that's around you. Yeah. But there's enough out there today. There are enough examples of, of both, I think, for most anybody to sit back and say, you know, do I have that entrepreneurial gene? Do I have a freelance gene? Am I going to be more comfortable with more certainty yeah. or security? You know, but look, part of the thing that's for sale today uh, is a word really a a big element of a, of a grown-up conversation is this idea that security still exists in the workforce the way it always has. I think it's pretty clear it doesn't, you know, and whether you call it the new economy or there are a thousand different words for it. Mm -hmm. In the end, uh, I think a lot of people are realizing they were always a freelancer. They just didn't, they just didn't own the identity. Mm -hmm. But look, after you've had three or four jobs in Silicon Valley over the course of two or three years, what else would you call yourself? Yeah, well, so let's unpack that just a little bit. Um, not everyone's got the chops for the uncertainty. I mean, that's, I think, 
in, speaking from personal experience, one of the most difficult things. And so if you, if you do make that conscious choice to pursue your dream, your passion, yeah. something that is not certain. And you know, I think you have a good point. I think even if you think you have a steady job, you probably don't. Right. The rug could get pulled out at any time. Yeah. Uh, funding gets lost or whatever the case. But you know, if you're working a traditional job and you have a boss, it's a little different than, than the folks that are living hand to mouth or they are, you know, you eat what you kill, that kind of mentality. Talk about some of those, what's difficult about that and how you maybe overcome it, how you have personally. Well, personally, I've always thought certainty was overrated. You know, um, it's critical. But the idea that you fall so in love with certainty that you start making all your decisions uh, based on a, a known or quantifiable outcome, that's kind of a, that's a sucker's bet. The truth is, if your life is filled with certainty, you're going to be bored, if you're normal, I think. In the same way that if your life is filled with uncertainty, you're going to be a nervous wreck, yeah. if you're normal. You know, most people, if they really step back and think about it, I think will agree that you need equal parts of certainty and uncertainty. Yeah. You need, for instance, the certainty of knowing that the sun is going to come up tomorrow, otherwise you're going to fall to pieces. But if every single sunrise looked exactly the same, it would kind of lose its, its wonder. So you need the uncertainty, which is just variety, and you need certainty, which is a measure of security. And if you've got that straight in your head, then I guess you can look around and decide, okay, I have nine kids. Maybe I'm gonna, <laughs> maybe I'm gonna hedge on the certain side. Yeah. Or maybe I don't have any kids. And maybe I do have uh, an opportunity, if I fail, to really hurt no one but myself. And I'll bounce back. And so maybe you assume a bit more risk. I don't know. Uh, but honestly, I'm suspicious of anybody who does. Because I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all uh, solution. I think everybody's got to try and figure it out for themselves, and that, that means getting bumped around a little bit. You said something else before, too, regarding passion. You know, and when people ask me what I learned from dirty jobs, uh, I always say the, the long answer is a 400-page book. I can't get around to finishing, but, but the short answers are many, and one of them is uh, a kind of debunking of platitudes and cliches, typically those successories that you see hanging in office buildings like this that say things like, you know, follow your passion. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture of a rainbow and some <laughs> and butterflies or, or some stuff. Yep. Um, I joked about that back in 2004 with a pig farmer on, uh, on Dirty Jobs. And, and he said, listen, the thing about passion is um, you got to have it, but only a moron would follow it. Bring your passion with you in all things, but never ever follow it. And so on Dirty Jobs we say don't follow your passion, but always, but always bring it with you. And if you look back at the 300 Dirty Jobbers we featured, many of whom, by the way, uh, are multimillionaires. We never pointed that out because that really wasn't, you know, the show wasn't a polemic. Yeah. It was just about people who were willing to get dirty. But at least half of the people we featured own their own business. They were entrepreneurs. They were inventors. They were very, very much outside of the box. They were just covered in crap or something <laughs> worse, yeah. you know. And so, it's it's interesting that people don't equate success uh, visually with that particular image. And that's one of the things the show uh, really tried to challenge, you know, in a fun way. But the business of not following your passion, the business of taking the reverse commute, that's very much a, a dirty jobs lesson. So when I think of the plumbers I've worked with on the show, all of whom were very successful, they all say the same thing. It wasn't their life's dream to be a plumber. You know, they didn't wake up in the mornings as a kid going, man, I just can't wait to get back into the sewer. Yeah. What they did, they got to the point in their life where it was time to make money, and they looked around at where everybody else was going, and they just went the other way. And so a lot of these guys on the show wound up doing something that was in no way a reflection of their uh, their wish fulfillment. But first they identified the opportunity, then they got good at it, yeah. and then they figured out a way to love it. Yeah, I, I actually heard something uh, from Mark Cuban recently along those same lines. He said, you know, if you're passionate about something and you're good at it, yeah, that's fine, but a lot of people pursue this passion and they suck. <laughs> like, go do what you're good at. 
yeah. and and do that, and then you know have fun on the side doing whatever projects you want to do. So I, or figure out a way to love it. Yeah, it sounds like well, that's what your message is. We're sitting here in where are we? West Hollywood. We're in Westwood. Westwood, yeah, close to UCLA. Okay, so I would say you know within one square mile of here, there are probably half a million people who are following their passion, and um, most of them, you know. Are waiting tables mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've got friends who are my age in this town right now who are still following their passion and I give them great credit because they're they're still having a good time but boy it's a struggle yeah you know and so it's it's fine fine if you want to do that but you just have to be suspicious of the uh, of the bromide yeah. you know Here's what you need to do. You just follow your passion and all the rest will fall into place. Well, that's, you know, education is broken there too. Go to school, get a degree, and then you got a great job. That's, yeah. I want to ask you, you know, about pursuing whatever goal, whether it's, um, you know, getting, learning a trade or, or going to school, whatever it is. How long do you give that great idea until you give up on it? <laughs> well, it depends what your goal is. If your goal is to, is to monetize it, not long. Really, you know, I mean, I wouldn't, unless I, unless I loved it so much, I didn't want to stop trying. Uh, if your goal is just to, you know, if it's a hobby that got out of hand, I suppose you'll never stop doing it. You know, the trick, of course, is to find out how to get paid for a hobby. Yeah. Um, but again, I'd just be suspicious of, of a pat answer. Yeah. You know, I, uh, this initiative we're doing now, Profoundly Disconnected, when in doubt, put it on your hat, right? Uh, it grew out of microworks, and it's essentially making the argument for alternative education. And I tell the story about how, uh, when I was in high school, back in Baltimore, my guidance counselor called me in to have a talk about my future, you know? He suggested maybe a choir, baritone in the choir, or? Uh... <laughs> he, had, he had two choices, uh, University of Maryland or, and James Madison, all right? Two really good schools, neither one of which I could afford. And I pointed this out, and I also said, besides, you know, I don't, uh, I don't know what I want to do. So I really think a two-year school, you know, a community college would be good for me. And uh, he said, well, that's, uh, that's, so, that's just not your potential. Yeah, don't bad, waste your time. bad decision. Yeah. So then he points over his shoulder at this poster. It's hanging on his wall, and it's a, uh, it's a picture of a graduate holding his degree, standing next to a mechanic covered in dirt, holding a wrench, looking like he just, you know, got the booby prize. Yeah. And the caption, and I swear to God, the caption says, work smart, not hard. Oh, wow. And that was actually a poster from a, a PR campaign for college back in the late 70s. And so today, when people ask me about that, you know, when, when we talk about the skills gap, when we talk about uh, outsourcing manufacturing, a crumbling infrastructure, currency devaluation, all this stuff, right? I think you can make a pretty good case that many of those problems are in fact uh, a consequence of a society that took that advice. We actually believe, I mean, Google works smart, not hard. Do it right now or when we're done. And you'll see it's hundreds of pages of examples. That stupid expression is on uh, merchandise. It's the title of books. Their, their conferences called Work Smart, Not Hard. Yeah. It's horrible advice, and we took it. You know, and so a lot of what we argue today is that, well, at least the point I try to make is uh, things like the skills gap are really just a reflection of what you believe. Yeah, I think, I think we've taken it just way too far out of context. It, you know, in some things it, it totally makes sense, um, but what we're talking about it does not. So, <laughs> so I want to know, and I love, my perception of you is you're, you're every man's man. In fact, I wish I sort of wish I was you some sometimes. Like, careful you wish for it. But like, when you go home, do you like put on um, a three-piece suit and you put on like? I have a smoking jacket, <laughs> ascot, uh, a tasteful. What do they call the things over the shoes? Spats. Yeah, I wear spats. No, this is the best part about the last ten years for me have been, you know, the realization that everything before it was just kind of BS in yeah. in terms of TV. Uh, this is who I am. You know, I wear a hat on the show and in real life because I don't have to worry about hair. Sure. Like, or makeup. And you're outside a lot. I mean, there's some outside all the time. Yeah. yeah, no makeup on dirty jobs, uh, no hair, no craft services, uh, certainly no wardrobe, and most interestingly, no second take. 
We never did a take two. Wow. Unless it was for uh, raps or something like that. Yeah. But the actual business of shooting the show, uh-uh. That's cool. Uh, but, but, you know, I think maybe something subtle to underscore here is the fact that you've built this brand. And it, maybe it's built on your authenticity. You know, you being who you are and not afraid to, to show it. But it's become a brand and, and it's translated into other opportunities, right? You've got sponsors who also see you as the person they want to align their brand with or maybe the face of their brand. Talk about that a little bit. Branding. Uh, I go back to you know, my own version of the reverse commute. It's it, the challenge in, in marketing, advertising, TV is almost always to find a way to rip off the last idea in a way that appears fresh. And most viewers know that that's just, you know, that's derivative creativity. And it gets rewarded enough to encourage everybody to keep doing it. But the truth is, it's, it's just terrible, you know. And when you find a, a really original idea in the middle of that, it really jumps out, even if it's small. Now, Dirty Jobs wasn't original. You know, you introduced me as the creator, which was nice, but I stole it from George Plimpton, you know. Uh, he was the first guy to really immerse himself in, in journalism, I think. And I just thought it would be fun to, you know, not be a host, but be a guest, be a, be a participant. Literally get your hands dirty. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the way it started for me was in terms of a reverse commute, I looked at what was happening on Discovery and History and Nat Geo and all those, all those cable channels. And everybody was obsessed with... Uh, with accuracy and, uh, and, and polish, mm -hmm. right? And so from a host standpoint, you had a lot of very careful people hitting the mark, saying the line, talking just like this, right? Yeah. And just whipping up all of the uh, credibility they could through their performance. So my pitch was, you guys don't need another host. You don't need another expert. You know, people are sick of it. What you need is a, is a fan. You need a viewer with access. So, you know, the first pitch for Dirty Jobs really was give me a small crew, some jet fuel, and leave us alone. And let me go out and look under the rock and see who we can find. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be no script. There'll be no take two. And there's going to be a lot of misinformation in the show that will clear up in VO later. But then, Cade was informed by Jumboa that the plan was changed. The plan is actually to spear stingrays today and chop down the tree tomorrow. What we're going to do tomorrow, we're going to attempt to do today. I'm not sure why, but it involves spears and looking for stingrays. Okay, so I guess today we're getting wood, which I guess means we're cutting down the tree after all. I think. Well, we're okay, and just like that, we're back to uh, getting stingrays. Well, actually, no. Exit. no, we're in a... A very fluid situation. <laughs> if you let the viewer see you try and occasionally fail, you'll ultimately be perceived as more authentic. And that's not just for me, that's for the network too. Yeah, it's right? endearing. It's honest, right? I mean, most people measure themselves by their failures as, as much as their success. So, yeah. so for me to become a kind of avatar instead of a host, to be a, a perpetual apprentice, you know, uh, 300 times in a row. Well, by the 20th or 30th time, I never underestimate the power of pity, you know. And people started to feel <laughs> a little sorry for me. <laughs> yeah. Because if it was a, if there was a joke, it was always on me. Yeah. You know, I never made fun of the people I worked with. If somebody was going to get a pie in the face, it was going to be me. Yeah. If somebody looked incompetent, it was going to be me. But the truth was. You know, the best way to pay a tribute to somebody who's really good at what they do is to let the viewer see somebody who's not as good try just as hard. Yeah. And then you get a measure, right, of what you're watching. And so that's what I meant before when I said we kind of Forrest Gumped our way into it. I know what I didn't want to do, but I didn't really understand in 2003 uh, how engaging that dynamic would be and how ultimately it would let me take that identity and leverage it in a lot of other ways, including some philanthropic ways, yeah. which happened later. Talk about what you're doing um, to make a difference. Talk about, about some of your, your projects. Yeah, well, first of all, you know, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a bloody do-gooder. I'm a reasonably nice guy, <laughs> but I'm a mercenary. I got into the business uh, 
to, to make money and to work on, on my terms. And I, I really failed at that, mostly, for about 20 years. Dirty Jobs happened, and it was a hit. And for three or four years, I worked really hard and kept my head down and was on the road about 300 days a year. Loved it. And then in 2008, the economy kind of craps the bed, right? Yep. And we got a huge problem. And suddenly, as I'm on the road, I start hearing the same things over and over and over from the industries I'm working in. And it's always recruitment. You know, whether you're a, a small business running a small mine somewhere or a, a running a small farm sure. or heating electrical company, finding people who are, will, who are skilled, you know, not just educated, but skilled and possessed of the work ethic, you know, that Horatio Alger wrote about or was, uh, is almost impossible. So over and over and over, again and again and again, state after state after state, businesses large and small, I start to hear the same thing. We just can't find people mm -hmm. who are willing to do this work. Yeah. And so I thought it was kind of interesting. As employment, as unemployment was going through the roof, this skills gap was opening up and it was affecting directly a lot of the industries that I was featuring on the show. So I thought, you know, it might be a decent thing to give something back to those industries and try and talk about that specific problem. Yeah. And so rather than um, doing a lot of focus group testing and hiring ad agencies and all that, I just went online and I asked the viewers of the show what they thought and if they would help me uh, build something. And they said, sure. And I said, well, let's start, send me the resources in your state or community for apprenticeships, scholarships, uh, on-the-job training opportunities, all these forms of alternative education. Mm -hmm. You know, Let's start to create a space online where all of these things can be quickly and easily found. And there was a trade resource center, we called it MicroWorks, and we set up a, a forum, and we, we were overwhelmed. I mean, overwhelmed. People just came again and again and again looking for this. This is not, not a monetizable thing. This is just something that I wanted to do. But, you know, th there was something in it for me, and that was it allowed me to talk about my show in this context, right? Instead it's doing of, good. Well, yeah. But look, you got to remember, Dirty Jobs is maybe the simplest show in the history of TV, except for maybe the gong show. You know, I mean, unscripted, one guy yeah. making it up as he goes. But the themes in the show were really, really big. You know, the dignity of work, uh, the definition of a good job, the changing face of the modern day proletariat, call it what you will. Yeah. The big meaty topics. Yeah. So when the economy turned in 2008, all these issues became relevant and people started asking me what I thought that led to the formation of this trade resource center. That turned into a foundation. And then I started going back to companies who I was in business with, like, like Ford and Caterpillar and Hewlett Packard and Motorola and Masterlock and uh, VF Corp and many, you know. And rather than do endorsement deals, we started doing partnerships. And part of those partnerships would always involve some component of the foundation, mm -hmm. some way to either publicize or give something back to MicroWorks so I could go out and tell a consistent story about the DNA of the show and the larger themes in the show. Yeah. So suddenly, I had the ability to promote dirty jobs not through the next exploding toilet or misadventure in animal <laughs> husbandry, <laughs> but through this idea of uh, really championing work and calling attention to the three million jobs that are available right now yeah. that employers can't fill. It was very grassroots and community focused too, right? Totally. Yeah, yeah look, and I, I call it micro-macro. You know, all things, pun intended, is, has a micro element yeah. and a macro element. So, so right now, for instance, we're in this campaign where we raise money for the foundation where I'm, I'm auctioning off the crap in my garage <laughs> that I accumulated over the years of dirty jobs. Sure. Right? And crap, collectibles rare and precious. Nice. Right? And it actually channels back to my, my first job in the industry, and, which was in, in the home shopping world at QVC. So anyhow, I'm auctioning off crap from my garage. At the same time, companies like Caterpillar are rolling out joint ventures with us to, to really try and move the needle in a big way in the area of, of tech recruitment. So 
all things are big and small at the same time. That's awesome. Let's talk about how you're using new media. You talked about, you know, you ask people online. <laughs> Maybe break it down for people who are watching because everyone's curious. You know, there's a Facebook frenzy and, and everyone's tweeting their fingers off and YouTube's exploding and then there's Pinterest. Are you using new media? And if so, how are you using it? I'm late to the party. Horribly, horribly late. Uh, in fact, not only am I, am I tardy, but I, I was sort of aggressively uh, against it. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I'm even quoted here and there saying, I think I'd rather shove hot needles in my eyes than send out a tweet. Yeah. So now I got 130,000 followers and I can, <laughs> I can still see. Uh, look, you can't ignore it. You know, it's, you, you can either, um, like the dot com, I'll build a site mentality is still very much out there. But I think it's tricky because you can either build a place and spend a lot of money and time trying to get people to come to it, or you can just go to where the people are. And the people are on Facebook, and the people are, are tweeting. So it, it does you no good to pretend that's not happening. Mm -hmm. But it also doesn't do you much good, I don't think, to simply go there and just vomit up your ideas, because that's what everybody else is doing. Yeah. I suspect it's a mix. So we have profoundlydisconnected.com. We have lessonsfromthedirt.com. We have microworks.com. And I also have built communities uh, socially. And I basically just filter whatever the message is through the broadest possible lens, which is Facebook, and then send them to whatever place that particular message might resonate best for. Yeah. In a way, you, you know, you're going out where the party is, and you're inviting them back to your house for a barbecue later on. That's right. And uh, right, it's perfect. Yeah, I mean, if it's a, you're not inviting everybody. Well, you are kind of inviting everybody, but you know, you know, like for instance, the other day, I had an hour, and I had a really unfortunate event happen on a jog across the Golden Gate Bridge, where my lower GI tract simply revolted based mm. on the burrito and the large Starbucks coffee I had had about an hour earlier. Bummer. And I felt compelled to share the humiliation <laughs> of very nearly soiling a national landmark uh, with the people who follow me on Facebook. And so I wrote about a thousand words on that little humiliation, and it got passed around, and like 700,000 people read it. Now that has nothing to do with any of the things we're talking about. Yeah. But to me, it makes sense. If you want to be authentic, you, you, you just can't be out there with the same message over and over. I mean, right, it's a marketing mantra that says you've got to be consistent. But I don't think so yeah. anymore. Well, well, I think it has everything to do with what we're talking about. It, your, your message is similar to everyone else who is doing it right, and that is be real. Be yourself. Um, <laughs> don't, give, don't give the wheel to someone else, you know, PR firm or someone else to, to say your words. Yeah. I mean, they can help, of course, with stuff that can be done, but, but you're being real. You're being you. And I think that's a very strong message of branding that a lot of people can maybe take to heart, you know. Yeah, but you got to be so careful too about uh, the inertia of your own smack. In other words, when Dirty Jobs got to the second season, it became really important to me to involve the crew on camera. I wanted the viewer to see the crew, and I wanted the viewer to see the making of the show, and that was what I wanted and it was authentic and I won that battle and because of it, or at least in part, the show went on for another seven years. Now, a lot of shows do that and I find myself wanting to do that on the next show. But you have to think about <laughs> how deliberate, they call it breaking the fourth wall mm -hmm. in TV, yep. right, when you see the crew. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like if you widen out and there he is, you know, and you see the camera and you see the lights and stuff. Um, once upon a time, that was groundbreaking and weird and it made viewers do this because it was different. Now, if you break the fourth wall on purpose, it's really no different than not breaking the fourth wall. Yeah, we're desensitized. On yeah. Right. And so there's this weird sort of dead zone where um, originality and authenticity becomes artifice and hackneyed production. Mm -hmm. I, don't know wh I, don't, I don't know where it is, but like most viewers, I know it when I see it. And, you know, TV's my world, so I can talk about it there, but I see the same thing in advertising. Yeah. I see the same thing in 
just about any kind of you know, messaging between a viewer, a customer, and a fan, they, their, their bullshit meter is just higher than people give them credit for. Let's change gears for a second and tell me, what's one of the hardest things you've ever had to do? <laughs> I guess, I guess the hardest thing professionally for me to adjust to was the, uh, was the success of 30 Jobs because I had become uh, arrogant in a, in a really specific way prior to that because I had figured out how to work in Hollywood on my terms. I was very proud of it. You know, I, I wasn't swinging for the fences. I was auditioning for a lot of the same stuff Jeff Probst and Ryan Seacrest would show up for, you know. But I wasn't looking for the hit. I was looking for the, for the miss. I, would, I mean, if you really do the math on Hollywood, nine out of 10 pilots fail. Right. And there's this desperate sort of feeling in town to find the winner. But there's a lot of money in the losers because they all have to get made, you know. So for me, the trick was, as a guy who was impersonating a host, the trick was if I can associate myself with enough of these things that need to get made, I'll get paid. And if I do a good job but the project fails anyway, I won't get blamed. <laughs> and so for about 15 years, that was my model. I was like the Titanic looking for icebergs, hmm. but knowing that I was in a lifeboat. And really, if I could find a project so poorly conceived that no amount of luck or talent could possibly salvage it, I would attach myself to it, work for three weeks, get paid, and then take some time off. And in this way, I had a model, and I liked it. And it, it allowed me to travel. It allowed me everything I wanted. Uh, Dirty Jobs was supposed to fit into that model. But it succeeded. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it really forced me to step back and say, okay, are you going to pretend this isn't working, uh, which, which would have been stupid, or are you just going to go with it? But if you go with it, you've got to leave this whole identity behind of this, of this freelancing. A nomad. You know, exactly. Yeah. Because now all of a sudden, I've got you know, eight people on a crew. I set up a separate business with my partner, and we've got a few employees. And it becomes one of the benchmark shows on the Discovery Channel, along with Deadliest Catch and, and Mythbusters. Suddenly I'm involved in two of the three big shows, and that's a big company, and now I've got responsibility. And on top of it all, you know, I'm face down in a sewer on any given day. Mm -hmm. So it was a very weird, sort of um, ironic place for me to find myself. Ultimately a really good place, but it did force me at, at 42 years old to really hit the reset button. It's great. I love that. So talk about the skills gap. Big and getting bigger. You know, it's um, unemployment gets all the press because 12 million people is a big number, you know, and another 8 or 9 million taking themselves out of the workforce. It's huge. But uh, in a way, you know, unemployment is, is kind of a perfect number no matter what it is because it just reflects the amount of jobs versus the amount of people looking for them. Mm -hmm. At least that's what we're told. But of course, that's not really the case. The fact is there are 3.7 million jobs right now that are waiting to be filled. Like what? Well, nearly 3 million of them uh, are a combination of transportation, utilities, and trades, the kinds of jobs you would see on dirty jobs. I was in Vegas. Um, a few months ago and ran into the woman who runs the local Caterpillar dealership. They need heavy equipment mechanics um, all across the country, but just right there in Vegas, they had 26, 27 openings. And these jobs, you know, can start in the mid-40s to mid-50s. You know, you got to get, get in it, but a good heavy equipment mechanic with a couple years' experience is making $120,000. Sure. They can't fill them. They can't find them. They are in a full-bore recruiting effort to try and get the country to see that there's opportunity here. And that's just Caterpillar, you know, Alcoa, State Farm, uh, John Deere, Ford, Toyota, they, you know, the big, big companies in the country are realizing this is, this is job one. And 
it's just hard for the, for the country to square the idea that we can have really, really high unemployment contemporaneously with mm -hmm. this widening skills gap. Because the skills gap clearly proves it's, it's not a lack of opportunity. It's not a lack of training. There are training programs everywhere. Just very few of them are maxed out. You know, the skills gap shows that something else is disconnected, and it has to do with desire. It has to do with our uh, uh, prevailing definition of what a good job is, right. right? So we don't tell our kids when we're sitting around the kitchen table and they're 10 years old, we don't say, you know, what you should think about is a heavy <laughs> equipment mechanic yeah. or a plumber. But, you know, I'm good friends with three plumbers. Uh, two of them own their own business. The, I mean, it's like Joe the Plumber from a few years ago. That guy was real, and there are lots of other guys out there like him. So the jobs that are available right now are the jobs that are typically looked at as a vocational consolation prize. Less than, yeah. Yeah. You weren't cut out for this, so maybe this would be good for you. It's completely backwards. It's completely upside down. So, you know, closing the skills gap is just a massive massively complicated undertaking, way beyond my pay grade. But I'm really interested in it, so I chip away at it, you know, as best I can. But it's just one of the ways that the country, in my opinion, has become disconnected from some really fundamental things. Yeah. Tell us about how then basically walking a mile in, in the shoes of the people that you visited over 300 episodes, how that's changed you and your personality and your perception of this kind of job? I guess more than anything, I mean, really on a personal level, it, uh, it reminded me of what I had become disconnected from. And I grew up with my eyes wide open. You know, my grandfather, I told you about, he, he was that guy. He was ultimately and utterly connected to the most fundamental things. Food, energy, um, dignity and work. You know, he just got it. And uh, I realized how far afield I had, I had drifted, just going on my own little uh, long and smelly odyssey here. But no, I remember a farmer told me once, uh, he was asking me about, you know, the dirtiest job I ever did, and I was telling him whatever I was telling him. And he said, you know, the truth is there, there are only two jobs in the whole world, two industries anyway, the jobs that come out of them. You know, you can trace all jobs back to two industries. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, agriculture and mining. And he's right. I mean, you look around this room, you know, everything in here, you know, from the, from the wood of the table to the, to the metal on, on the cameras, everything we use is either grown or, or pulled from the ground. Mm -hmm. And the business of work for millennia has been the front line of turning those products into something useful, right? Whether it's something we can eat, something we can fashion into furniture, or something we can, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the plasma on a screen, you know. So, you know, to, to be connected to work uh, involves a lot of different things, I think, but, but one of it is just understanding that, you know. We, we, you start with two industries, and it's so easy to look at your smartphone and it's so easy to look at the new toolbox from Silicon Valley, and it's so easy to, you know, to lose sight of that. And from there, it's not very far to flicking on the light switch and not being that impressed anymore, or flushing the toilet and you know not being gobsmacked by the fact that your business just magically went away. Those are miracles, you know. And I think part of the reason the skills gap is so wide is that a huge hunk of the population is no longer suitably impressed uh, with that. So, you know, closing the gap is not just about uh, reinvigorating the trades. It's about fostering an appreciation in the, the public at large, the people who are the most direct beneficiaries of the work. You know, until we're collectively re-impressed with all that, it's still going to be a very, very tough sell for the biggest employers in the country to find the people who are willing to get excited about learning a skill and mastering a trade. We just have to think differently about it. All right, we've been spending a few minutes with actor and entrepreneur Mike Rowe. Mike, thanks so much for being part of the show. It's fair to say I was acting like an entrepreneur, or am I actually 
an entrepreneur. You're doing it now. No, I'm acting right now. Okay. See? He didn't even know that. You're that good. Scary. See what he did? <laughs> this Behind the Brand episode is brought to you by DocuSign, the global standard for e-signature. Get your free trial at DocuSign.com forward slash Behind the Brand. to redo my whole demo reel now. This changes everything. Thank you. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Thank you. That was my pleasure. Next time I'm sitting there, though. You got it. You can sit here. That's a deal. I'll ask the questions. We're going to arm wrestle now. <laughs>